Hello and welcome to Auto Shenanigans. How the devil are you? Have you had a good week? My name is John. Thank you very much for joining me for another exciting episode of Secrets of the Motorway. Today we'll be looking at Scotland's oldest motorway, the M90. It runs south to north for about 36 miles, starting at Kirkleston on the west side of Edinburgh up to Perth. And interestingly, whilst indeed it is the oldest motorway in Scotland, it's also one of the newest. Allow me to explain. The first section of the M90 opened in 1964, but the start of the motorway as we know it today wouldn't come until much later, with construction finishing between 2013 and 2017, so it's about 50 years in the making. The first couple of miles running up from Junction 1 started life as the M9 motorway, or perhaps more accurately a spur of the M9 motorway. This was later extended to meet the A90, allowing for traffic on the M9 to access the fourth road bridge and vice versa. At the time, the M90 did exist, but not here. It wouldn't be until 2017 and the opening of the Queen's Ferry Bridge that the M90 would start to take its more familiar shape, and indeed the southern parts of the M90 were constructed purely to accommodate the new bridge. Until its construction, the only road crossing over the 4th was via the A90 and the 4th Road Bridge. This bridge opened in 1964 and in theory had a design lifespan of 120 years. However, this was based on traffic levels of around 11 million vehicles per day and by 2006 that figure had more than doubled, leading to quite a few issues. In short, if things had carried on the way they were, by 2019 it was expected that the bridge would be closed due to structural issues. The solution was to build another bridge. Bigger. Longer. Wider stronger and able to handle the increase in traffic levels. Construction on the 2,700 metre long Queen's Ferry Bridge started in 2011 at a cost of £1.35 billion. The idea was to create a motorway connection across the 4th. On the south side they built some more motorway. Where before we had the M90 connecting up with the A90, the motorway would spur off to a newly created Junction 1A before heading over the bridge and connecting up with some more of the M90 that had already been constructed. We'll come back to that later. The original fourth row bridge is still standing, despite concerns over its structural integrity. Measures have been taken to extend its lifespan, and of course, the majority of traffic now uses the M90 and the Queensferry Bridge. So how long will the fourth row bridge last? Well, it's anyone's guess, really. As you cross the fourth via the M90, take a look out to your right and you get a great view of the fourth road bridge, and behind that, the fourth rail bridge. This iconic structure was completed in 1889. Fuck knows how they managed that but it's quite impressive and recognised across the world. You see this bridge, you think Scotland. It was the first major structure in the UK to be made out of steel. Until this point, similar structures had used wrought iron during construction due to its lower cost. However, new refining and forging techniques were being discovered all the time, leading to the mass production of steel, which reduced the cost significantly. And that's probably just as well, because over 55,000 tonnes of steel was required to build it. Oh my God, what is this coming over the railway bridge? After crossing the 4th, we arrive at Junction 1B, which serves as a merge point between the M90 and the A90, which for some reason has now been renumbered as the A9000. We don't care either way, because if we're driving on the motorway, we can glide over the junction via its overpass. Whilst you're doing that, keep an eye out on your right for the steel girder Jamestown Viaduct, which was constructed along with the 4th Rail Bridge in the late 1880s. Just behind the junction is Cruick's Quarry. It opened in the early 1800s, but sources suggest it was abandoned in 2009. I happened to find this though, the remains of an old viewing point. I've never seen one of these before, so I thought I'd come and look at the viewing point infrastructure rather than the viewpoint itself. In any case, I can't because they've sealed off the gate now and you can't use it. But I did get the drone up, so we can at least appreciate what the view might have looked like should we have been able to have accessed it. The next junction along is Junction 1C. 1C? I can't recall any other examples of a C junction on any motorways. If you've got any ideas, do let me know. In any case, we're three junctions into the M90 now and we haven't even got to Junction 2 yet. The section that runs between Junction 1C and Junction 2 is the oldest section of the M90, having opened in 1964. You'll recall earlier that I mentioned the M90 south of here was built over the 4th and then connected up with an existing piece of M90, and indeed, this is that existing piece. The M90 north of here was mostly constructed throughout the 60s, 70s and 80s. It was only the southern section of the M90 that was built in more modern times. Junction 2 is a wonderfully designed interchange where the M90 meets the AA23M. There's a whole story to this interchange which you can learn all about in the AA23M video, but part of it was that originally there was supposed to be a motorway heading through the interchange heading towards the east. Whilst the interchange was built to allow for this, the plan was cancelled. 
I say cancelled, it was more a case that they just changed their minds, and the result of them doing so is what gives us the rather odd arrangement between junctions 2A and 3. Originally, there was supposed to be a motorway heading east from junction 2. Instead, they built an A road heading east from junction 3, achieving a similar but not quite as good result. It's known as the A92, and after its completion, Junction 3 turned into a complete mess. The simple roundabout-style junction just couldn't handle the level of traffic that was being fed to it from the M90. What you needed was a nice free-flowing motorway interchange, preferably to the south, where you'd already left space for it. But it was a bit late for that, so they improvised a solution, whereby in the late 90s they added a set of free-flowing slip roads to link the M90 to the A92, and this allowed traffic on the M90 to avoid the junction altogether. The slip roads were given their own junction number, Junction 2A, and it's been that way ever since. Just after Junction 3, and the motorway passes under the Netherbeath Road Bridge. The road is now abandoned, but you can still access the bridge via car, which is good because it means I don't have to walk. The road used to serve the Kearsbeath... Oh, hello. Fucking hell. Where did he come from? The road used to serve the Kearsbeath open cast coal mine, which operated for a short time between 1982 and 1992. I haven't found any remains or leftovers of the coal mine, and considering this is how open cast mines usually look, it was either really small or they'd done an excellent job in covering it up. Whilst there's nothing left of the Kearsbeath mine, just up the road and on the other side of the M90 is where we find the St Ninian's open cast mine, also known as the Walnut Whips. This old mine has now been turned into a destination for walkers, with bits of the leftover mine used for decoration purposes. Unlike Kearsbeath, here we can clearly see the cuts in the land left over from the previous mine, and if we take a look at some historical satellite images, we can see how the mine used to look. In more recent times, the site has been earmarked for redevelopment. What was before a freely accessible site reclaimed by nature, offering a lovely day out and some lovely views, will soon be replaced by a series of wellness centres, offering a lovely day out and some nice views, for a cost. They say it's all about your mental health, and these wellness centres have been designed to meet an increasing need for places close to nature. Sure, there's going to be a spa, gym, craft centre, and a host of other chargeable amenities, but the ever-increasing need for natural green spaces is solved by building a load of tat on a natural green space, and then charging you for it. Junctions 4 and 5 are similarly crap, or should I say basic? They sit on a section of M90 that opened in 1969, making them some of the oldest junctions on the motorway. It's unlikely that you'd design a motorway junction like this today. Having slip roads opposite one another can be a bit of an arse. However, the saving grace for these junctions is that they probably see the same sort of traffic levels as they did in the late 1960s, so they still function without a problem. Another unique and design age related feature is the lack of hard shoulders from Junction 5 onwards. Instead, you get the occasional small slither of tarmac to squeeze onto when there's an emergency. It's far from ideal but we've perhaps seen this sort of thing before. In the olden days, when the road planning rules were a little bit more flexible, Scottish road planners decided that hard shoulders were optional, and in the case of the M90, on certain sections, they just didn't build them, so good luck. Having bypassed Kinross, we arrive at Junction A, which is quite unique. Whilst it is simply a fork consisting of two slip roads, it connects to another fork, which leads to an interesting layout. As for why we have this layout, back in 1971, they'd only completed the M90 as far as Junction 8, where it would terminate and connect up with the A90, so the layout makes sense. And interestingly, the junction hasn't changed since its initial construction. They had intended to extend the M90 onwards from Junction 8, but in 1971 were still considering their route options. North of Junction 8 was proving to be the most challenging section of motorway to work on due to the land's topology. Add in the oil crisis in 1973, and it seemed like the M90 would be terminating at Junction 8 forever. By 1977, they'd managed to extend the motorway a few miles up to a temporary terminus on the other side of Glenfarg. Good news as well, because they installed the hard shoulders correctly on this section, so from Junction 8 onwards, you've got hard shoulders to enjoy. Some bad news, though, is that in order to continue the motorway up to Junction 9, they deleted the Glenfarg Railway. The railway managed to escape beaching, but was closed to make way for the motorway. The reason for doing so is because it was proving too much of a challenge to route and build the motorway through the area. By taking bits of the railway, which are famously flat, they had a nice bit of track bed to work from as a starting point when it came to the motorway. Although perhaps disappointingly, they only used what I would consider a small stretch of the original railway route. Did they need to remove the whole thing? I'm not so sure. However, in doing so, they've accidentally left over some abandoned railway infrastructure. I say accidentally, it's not like you can easily remove such things, is it? There's the pair of 500 metre long Glenfarg railway tunnels if you fancy a walkabout. They were built in 1890, but of course the motorway put an end to their use in the 1970s. One of the tunnels is on a curve, so when you're halfway through it, it's impossible to see either end. And remarkably, they're open for all. You wouldn't get this in England, would you? They'd all be sealed off in case little Stephen hurts himself. And it keeps getting better. Just at the entrance to one of the tunnels, there's a little viaduct to enjoy as well. An impressive feature of the M90 can be found just before Junction 9 at Balmano Hill. 
It involves a curve with a 694 metre radius and is said to be one of the tightest curves on the motorway network, although I assume they're not including slip roads in that. As you drive round the curve and head down into the Urn Valley, the M90 once more picks up the route of the former railway line. Just as you pass through Junction 9, on your right is the site of the former Bridge of Urn Hospital. It opened in 1939 as part of the war effort, with the NHS taking over in 1948, where it would operate, pun absolutely intended, as a general medical hospital. The site would then eventually close in 1992, where it would sit abandoned for many years before all of it was demolished in 2006. There have been several plans submitted to redevelop the area, but as it stands, nothing's really come to fruition, other than a few newly built houses on a small section of the site. Interestingly, a new road that was built along with those houses is called Smiley Place, and it's named after Ian Smiley, one of the leading surgeons who worked at the hospital. Junction 10 is known as the Craig End Interchange, and it's where things start to go a bit tits up. It's mostly a motorway to motorway interchange, but it's at this point that the M90 splits into two spurs, heading off in different directions. I'm pretty sure it used to make a lot more sense, but following some questionable decisions in the 90s, we are where we are. So how did this all start? Well, it was always intended to have this strange interchange and split of motorways, but it was never intended to all be part of the M90. The E spur used to be the M85, and the M85 was really just a motorway spur connecting the A85 to the M90. No worries. As for the Western spur, it served as a continuation of the M90, so again, no worries. The only thing I'm not sure about is why they didn't design the interchange in such a way that would allow for a continuation of the carriageway when you're on the M90. At the moment, you've got to come off the M90 and rejoin the M90 a little bit further up. Oh well, it's not perfect, but it works. Unfortunately, Scotland's road planners thought otherwise and in the mid-90s went about renaming and renumbering a whole host of different roads just because they could. What was previously the A85 was now the A90 and what was the M85 was now the M90. In Scotland, motorways tend to get their numbers from whichever A road they relieved. Originally, the motorway was relieving the A85, so of course it was the M85, but when it was changed to the A90, then the motorway had to change as well. Except it didn't really. It could have been left as it was and I think the whole thing would have probably made a bit more sense than it does now. It's not helped by the woefully inadequate signage found at Junction 10, which merely suggests left for the A9, right for the A90. With that in mind, which way do we go? Well, to finish the motorway in numerical order, we're going to need to head right towards the A90, where we find Junction 11. At first glance, it's quite a confusing junction, but one source suggests it's easier to treat it as one large roundabout made by the A85, with the motorway slip roads joining in the middle. To get to Junction 11, you'll need to cross over the River Tay via the 830 metre long Friarton Bridge. The bridge was completed in 1978, and until the Queensferry Bridge came along in 2017, it was the largest structure to be found on the M90. Using the roundabout-ish thing that we find at Junction 11, we can head back on ourselves and then take a right to head up towards Junction 12, the last junction on the M90. And it's nothing more than a roundabout where you'll find the A9 and the A93. However, Junction 12 can take the title as the most northerly motorway junction, and indeed the most northerly point you can get to on a motorway. From this point on, no more motorways. And there we are then guys, that's all we've got time for this week. Thanks very much for watching, I hope you liked the video. If you did, there is of course a button specifically for that. And if you haven't subscribed already, please consider doing so. That'd be quick, it's sweet, awesome. Enjoy the rest of your week, whatever it is you get up to. My name's John, you've been watching Auto Shenanigans and I'll see you guys next time for another exciting episode of Secrets of the Motorway. Until then, take care, bye bye.